God that she lived. So at the end, we are going to share some information about her and we'll have questions and answers. So now here's the life of America's abolitionist and suffragette sojourner of truth. My mama told me I had 12 brothers and sisters. 
But they were also lost by the time I knew what was going on. I was the only one left. The only one left. So on a daily basis, I would see my mom just cry. Sometimes she would sit outside at night. Oh, and the tears just rolling down her face. I said, Mom, what ails you? She said, oh, girl, I don't know where my children's been. And they don't know where I've been. Oh, I just long to hold them one more time next to her bosom. I don't know where my children's been. They're all sold off. God knows where. I'm back there looking up at that same moving star. Right now, just like I'm looking up, wondering where I'd be, and I'm wondering where they'd be. I just hope that God will keep them safe wherever they may be. I said, Mom, Dad, where does God live? She said, Dad, you see the spaces between the skies, between the stars? That's where God lives. God lives between all the spaces between the stars. And she said, well, I'm going to tell you something, girl, that's going to last you for the rest of your life. Remember, Belle, don't lie. Don't steal. Work real hard to show yourself proof in your master's eyes. Oh, and Belle, don't forget to pray, Belle. Don't forget to pray, Belle. If you're lonely, you get beat, you get sold, you just don't know which way to turn. You pray to God there, and God will tell you exactly what to do. You remember that now, you hear? I said, yes, I'll remember that. And I remember that for the rest of my life. God became my best friend. I would walk along and talk to God, like God was right next to me. But God was a real person. And they started teasing me. They said, they go old bell. All she do is pray and talk to God all day long. But God was my best friend. I called them old friends. During my lifetime, I was sold three times. The first time I was sold, I was sold to the Indians. I was sold with a flock of sheep and hundred dollars, and I went along in the bargain. Well, the needles were just mean to me to pray and me. Mrs. Neely will tell me to bring a log from the fireplace, and I'll bring maybe the pot and pan or spoon. And she would just beat me and beat me. You see, I just didn't understand the language. I was brought up in a Dutch household, so I only spoke low Dutch. Even when I learned the meaning of the objects, she would beat me morning, noon, and night just to beat me. What the things mean? My daddy got word of all the beatings morning, noon, and night. So my daddy said, Belle, I gotta come and try to save you, girl, because they're gonna kill you with all the beatings, Belle. I was only about nine, ten years old. So my daddy went three plantations over and convinced somebody else to buy me from the mean old means. Because they were going to kill me before the beatings. So my daddy convinced the scribes to buy me. So I was sold the second time to the scribes. And the scribes had a tavern. So my job was to keep everything nice and neat on the shelf, keep all the wood piled up on the fireplace, Dust everything, keep everything nice and neat. But there were some mean and ugly people that come through that tavern. Every day I had to hold my ground. Every day I had to hold my ground. Being a woman child, and all the ugly men coming through there, I tried to stay close to Mr. Swire so he could see me. I dared not venture off too far from him. And in that tavern is where I picked up two bad apples I too proud of. Picked up a few choice words here and there. Because every day they would curse at me, I would have to curse back at them to hold my ground every day. So I said, Good friend, this ain't me. 
all those words they're not needed. So over a period of time, my good friend just took it right from me. The second half that I picked up in that time, and I ain't too proud of, learned to smoke a tobacco pipe. At night, I would sit and just rock in the chair and smoke that tobacco pipe. It seemed like it brought peace to me. But that's a bad. You always talk about cleanliness is next to godliness. I didn't expect to go to heaven with tobacco breath. I said, well, when I die, I expect to leave my breath behind, you see. I said, well, God, you always tell us this. But I prayed to my good friend, and over a period of time, he just took that tobacco right from me. I said, thank you, dear friend. I can always depend on you, dear friend. Then I got word my dad was feeling poorly. So I got permission to go back to check on my dad. Oh, when I got there, he was in a bad way. He was dragging his leg. I could hardly see. I said, Daddy, it's me, Belle. I come to check on you. He said, let me touch your face. Oh, my little girl, you come to check on me, Daddy. I said, yes, sir, Daddy. So I helped Daddy to a chair. I helped him to sit down and gave him some water. You see, we lived in the cellar of the Hattenberg's house. I hated it in that cellar. It was always cold and dark and damp, no light. When it rained, it made mud puddles on the floor. So we would take our mattress made out of leaf or straw, and we would try to draw away from that water, trying to keep dry and warm. So me and Mama helped Daddy back down that old cellar. We made a fire in the fireplace and we covered it over with some old quilts. And within two days, my daddy died. So me and mom buried daddy the best we could. And then I went on back to the scribes to work. I continued working at the scribes. Within about six months, I got word that my mom was here in poor. So I got permission to go back to check on my mom. And when I got there, she was sick when I was there with daddy, but she didn't let on. She said, Dad, let me hold your hand. Remember what I told you? Don't lie, don't steal. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's a good thing. You remember that now, you hear? I said, yes, ma'am. And my mama died right there holding my hand. So I buried my mom the best I could. And I went on back to the squatters. I said, oh, dear friend, everybody that I care about is taken away from me. All my brothers and sisters sold off. Mom and Daddy home, now it's just me. So I continued working at the Scribers, and about four years or so, the Scribers moved. So they sold me the third time to the Dumonts. And on the Dumont place, I continued to work. I was always big for my age. I was not old, but I was always big. I could hear Dumont talking. You see that bell right there? She's strong. She's strong. The two men put together. And she don't cause me no trouble. All she do is work and pray all day long. So I can hear them talking about me. But I don't mind talking about me. So this particular day, we're picking beans in the field. I got up to wipe my sweat. And I looked around. There was a wagon from another plantation. Who the handsomest man was driving that wagon? I watched that wagon until it was way behind the barn. He sure was handsome. I went on back picking beans. I was so busy picking beans, I didn't let Mr. Wagon come back by. When I stood up, he was coming towards me. He said, my name is Wild. What's yours? Um, well, so you think I could come court with you sometimes? Yes. <laughs> I said, but wait, first I gotta ask Master Do want permission. You gotta ask permission too. So I asked Master Do want if Robert could come court with me. He said, all right, Robert can come court with you on Sunday, one day off. Well, I couldn't wait for Robert to come. But he would come on Sundays, he would walk down on a pond, he would get rocks and throw it in the pond water. Sometimes my uncle would find a wild flowers and he would pick it and give it to me. And we would sit by that big old tree and we would talk about everything. We would talk about the 
the birds flying, and the bees and everything. But most of the times we're going to talk about what would it feel like to be free? What would it feel like to be free? Would we look different? Everything we have would be ours. But what would it feel like to be free? And me and Robert talked about that every Sunday when Robert would come. And I was falling in love with Robert and he was falling in love with me. We talked about getting married. And having a family and building a little cabin. But oh. Master Dumont was going to have none of that. Because if I fall in love and get married to Robert and move to his plantation, he would lose me. And I could have children. That would be more property for him. More hands to help him around the place. So he wasn't going to have none of that. So he arranged for Robert to be beaten. And the word got back to me that they beat Robert really bad. And after three weeks, Robert died from all the beatings. I said, oh Lord, everybody that I care about is taken away. Here I am all by myself again. So just help me to be strong, dear friend. Just help me to be strong. So I continued working in the fields, praying to my good friend. Master two months of that. I think it's time now to take on a husband. I wasn't, I didn't want to get married. I just wanted to work and pray and just be by myself. But I had no choice in that. I had to get married to Thomas. And the word got around. Thomas had already been married two times. So I got married to Thomas. And together we had five children. Well, actually, I had six, but one of my boys died at birth. So I had four girls and one boy. My oldest daughter was Diana, had Elizabeth, Mary, and the youngest daughter was Sophie. And I named my little boy Peter. His mama told me I had a brother named Peter. So I would take Sophie, put Sophie on my back, band her up, continue to work in the fields. When Sophie got to too heavy for me, I would take Sophie off, tie her on the branch of the tree, and just let her swing. And I continued to work. And as long as I saw her swing the breeze and not crying, I know she was just fine. So I continued working in the fields. That's when you find out where everything's going on. This particular day, everybody's talking. I said, what's everybody talking about? They said, oh, we've heard some news this morning. And we're going to pass it on to make sure that everybody here. I said, what did y'all hear? He said, well, in three years' time, July 4th, 1827, New York State's going to pass a law saying that anybody born before 1797, a woman 25 could be free, a man 19 could be free. I said, you sure you got the dates and time right? I said, yeah, we got it right. We're going to pass it on to everybody know it. I said, tell me one more time to make sure I got it. I said, in three years' time, New York State's going to pass a law, July 4, 1827, saying that anybody born before 1797, a woman 25 could be free, a man 19 could be free. Oh, I thought about that. I don't quite know how old I was, but I'm figuring in three years I should be at least 25, at least 25. That means me. In three years' time, I could be a free woman. Mama said, work real hard to show yourself proof in your master's eyes. Oh, I started working at one o'clock. I started picking all the beans. I started putting all the beans in the jars, putting all the beans in the jar, putting them in the smokehouse. Picking all the beans, putting them in the smokehouse, got all the wheat, put them in the big bales. Put all the wheat in big bales. One year passed. Sometimes I was so tired, I would just go by the barn and lean to just catch my breath. Sometimes it would be dark. I said, Well, it's a tough girl coming out the field. I said, No, I just want to finish this one row. Going on two years. One of the older person there said, Well, well, I see you working real hard. What you doing? I said, I got one and a half more years to work before I can be free. And I'm going to 
get all the work done so nice and you want one, say one word, you'll have nothing to say. No, 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 Bell. I'm going way back on this plantation with Master Moore. He ain't gonna keep his word. He's gonna come up with some kind of excuse to keep you here, Bell. This is how you survive around here, girl. And he's around, you work real hard. As soon as he turns his back, you need something, big Bell. That's how you survive, girl. The way you're going, you're going to kill your fool self. See? He's getting ready to go into town. As soon as they get around the corner, I'm going to go into that tree and take him back. And have one of the little children wake him up when he comes back. That's how you survive around here, girl. I said, no. I'm going to get everything done because I don't want him to say nothing. I believe in the Lord. That's what the Lord says. All right, as for me, I'm going to take him back. You go on and kill your fool self. Oh, started getting all the wool off the sheep, putting all the wool in bags, putting all the bags in the shed room. Two years passed, I started cutting all the logs. Oh, and one time I cut my fingers so bad, I had to bend with my fingers so old rise. Started cutting with my left hand, cut the logs, cut them all together, pile them all up. Three years. Three years time came. Oh, I said, I can't sleep tonight. In the morning, I'm going to be a free woman. Oh, I can't sleep. I thought about everything I could do being a free woman. Oh, I said, all right. I'm going to learn to read and write. That's the first thing. And I'll make sure my children learn to read and write. Oh, I can get some pretty sackcloth and make me and my daughter some pretty dresses. Oh, Let's see what else I can do. I'll build myself a little cabin. I don't know where, but I'll build myself a little cabin and plant some pretty flowers. I looked outside. Oh, the sun's not even peeking yet. But, um, I thought I wanted to read and write. I'm going to build a school. And then I'll teach everybody to read and write. That's what I'll do. And that's all. Saying that I can be free. Maybe I'll study the law. Because the law said I can be free. I'll study the law and then I'll free everybody. There'll be no more slave anywhere. That's what I'll do. And then I'll build my school in every city. I'll call it the Bell School. That's what I'll call it. The Bell School. The sun is just beginning to peak. I said I'll walk real slow. And by the time I get to back to do my house, maybe the sun will be up. So I walked slow and thought about all the things I could do being a free woman. Oh, let's see what else I can do. Um, maybe I'll build a store. And I can sell things in the store. Just by the time I got to his house, the sun was just being. I can't wait for long. Who is it? That's the dude on his sweet bell. Today's the day, sir, the New York State passed that law saying I could be a free woman. <laughs> you better be a part of bell. The sun's not up yet. Talk to some free day. Hold up, I'll be ready. Oh, oh it's just a matter of time, bell. Before you be a free woman, bell. When he finally came out, he was screaming his suspense and said, You better be a bell. Somebody even up yet to wake me up some free day. What you talking about, Mel? I said, Master Duma, today is the day that New York State passed that law, saying that I could be a free woman. You sure it's today? I said, oh, yes, sir. Well, how do you know it's today? I said, because since I heard about this, I do three long sticks. And every day I've been marking one for each day has been three years. And we go into town, when we see a sign, we say, what that sign say right there? And they read that sign, it says, today's the day. And we've been hearing people talk about it. We've been hearing you talk about it to other people. This is the day, sir. Hmm. Huh. Well. I remember you cut your finger one time. That should put on for some more time right there. Mr. the best to do Now look, I worked every day for three years, even Sunday, my one day off. Look, as far as the eyes can see, everything's done. Everything's done. There's nothing in the field. There's no hole on the sheet. Everything's done. From that, according to that document, it said that.
that anyone who is manly minted must be of a said province and they must be able to sign their signature on the dotted line saying that they have indeed read the document and perfectly understood everything that's on the document and the proprietor will have to sign also and he went on and on. I know you were just um, trying to throw me off. I said, that's too much. You can go in the house, take your time, sign the paper, bring it back. I'll put my mark on there. You don't have to rush, sir. I'll oh, wait right here. You ain't gonna sign the papers. Master Dumont. I worked I work real hard the last few years for not to sign the papers. But the law said you should sign the papers. Well, I'm going to wait right here every day in case you change your mind. I'll wait right here with stamp in case you change your mind. Slam the door. I really know my step. Tell them it's dark. And then when I come back up and sign the papers, I know I should be free. I know it. I believe in the law. The law said I should be free. I've been free for the law for three years. Mama said, pray now. Well. Because you don't know what to do, pray now. Well. I said, oh, dear, I'm free. What shall I do, dear friends? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Walk away, Belle. Is that your God? Walk away, Belle. Is that your God? Walk away to your freedom, Belle. Just come on back. He says, I 
I didn't go off neither. In the cool of the morning, I walked away with my child, and I ain't going back on not your property. So the argument went back and forth, back and forth. So the bad wife says, Bell, you've never done this, but we're going to buy you just to get rid of Duan. How much is it for the woman and child? $20 for the woman, $5 for the child. They gave him the money. On his way out, he says, we'll meet again. Because the children are still back there with me. We'll meet again. Oh, I was praying before, but now I was praying all day long. I was sitting and praying all day long. Oh, for God to keep it in his care. After about six months or so, I got the word that he sold my son Peter to his brother down in Alabama. When the soul deep south, you never see the folks again. I went back there. I'll have my son back. He said, I told you we'll meet again. It's a done deal. You'll never see your son again. He said, I'll have my son back. You'll see it. I walked into Kingston. I walked into Long Island. I walked into New York City. Anybody who will hear me, please. Please help me get my son back, please. You saw my son across state line. Please help me get my son back. I won't clean out my shoes. I took the little shoe that was left and I put it on my shoulders. I was getting worn and riding. Please, anybody, please help me get my son back, please. Finally, one gentleman says, ma'am, I heard you. He was a lawyer from the Quaker Society in New York City. He said, I think I can help you. All we had to do was petition the court with a written document saying that he was illegally sold across state lines. Can you read it right? He says, no, I can't read it all right. He says, well, I'll sign your name, and you just put your X right next to your name. He says, we'll give the judge the paper, and whenever we hear anything, I'll let you know. So I went back to the bad wife and continued to sing and pray around the clock. Pray and sing around the clock. After about two years, the lawyer says, man, good news, he was on his way back to New York City. I said, thank you, dear friend. Thank you, dear friend. I can always depend on you, dear friend. When we get to New York early that morning, the ride came around the corner. I was so happy to get my son back. But when he got out of the wagon, oh, Methodist 
church in New York City. I told the minister my story. He said, well, we've got a little place out back behind the church where we keep our spare hymnals and brooms and chairs and things. You're really welcome to stay now. I said, thank you. At least I'll be out of the weather. It was a small place. I had to scoop down to get in there. But we had a barrel where we put the wood in it to make a fireplace and kept us warm. We were out of the rain and the snow. So we stayed in the back of the St. John Methodist Church. And of course, I went inside the church and started making myself useful. I started dusting, making sure all the hymnals are together, all the chairs are just right. And that's why I worship on Sundays at the St. John Methodist Church. But I didn't like the, the arrangement they had there. They had all the colored people to be up in the balcony and all the white people down front. I said, now, if God were to come here right now, I would be able to walk right out of my seat and tuck the hand of this garment. I said, here I am, God, this is me, Bell. But if I have to come all the way from the balcony, all the way down the flight of steps, down the front, and come down the bottom, God would be gone by the time I got there. So I want to place some worship I can sit on the front seat in case God comes along. So I found my place of worship. It was an A and B Zion Church in New York City. So I stayed in the back of the Methodist Church, but I went to worship at the A and B Zion Church. By now, Peter, of course, was getting older, getting himself into trouble. Twice I had to go out to the constable office so they wouldn't lock him up. He was doing some devilish things to the walls. I said, what can we do with Peter? I said, man, times are hard right now. There's nothing. But he said, I read in the paper, the merchant marines are hiring. So we signed people off for the merchant marines. For two years, <clears throat> they're talking about a read and write. And he got his uniform on, he was tall and handsome. And he sailed off on the SS Nantucket whaling ship. Oh, that was a happy day we bid goodbye to Peter. He would write letters to him saying that he's having a good time. He's making new friends, he's enjoying the sights. But after a while, the letters stopped coming. I don't know what happened to my son Peter. So I continued to worship at the A.B. Zion Church, continued to live in the back of the Methodist Church. I would take a wash and wash people's clothes and make a few pennies here and there. But my daughters were still back at Dumont. Because they had to stay there until they were 25. But something told me to go back there. I said, dear friend, work on Dumont's heart for me. And I went back there. And he met me at the gate. He said, Belle, come on in, come on in. We sit down. We got coffee and drank coffee. He said, Belle, please forgive me for all the wrong things I did to you. He said, that slave is one of the meanest slaves one person could ever do to another. Please forgive me for all the wrong things I did to you. He said, now your daughters would have to stay here until they're 25 across the wall. Because if I let them go, I'll also be arrested. But I'll make sure they have clothes, food, and they're treated very well. You can let your youngest daughter Sophie come and live with her sisters as you like. You can bring her on Mondays and pick her up on Fridays. I need a place for soul to stay. So I said, that's a good arrangement. So we shook hands, and I would bring Sophie there on Mondays, pick Sophie up on Fridays. God worked on Dumont's heart. I can always depend on a good friend. I can always depend on a good friend. So one Sunday, I was coming back from church. I met a gentleman in a long robe with a beard. He said his name was Matthias, and he was from the kingdom. They had a big commune on the outskirts of town. And he said, everybody's welcome in the commune, all colors. Men and women are equal. And everybody left, I shook his hand. I said, you know what? I'm thinking the same thing. Men and women should be equal. No man should have a dominion over a woman. And everybody should be equal. All colors should be able to get along together. He said, you can come and live 
with us if you like. And I needed a place to stay. So, after about two weeks or so, I moved into the commune on the outskirts of town. Oh, they had all kinds of animals there, all kinds of fruit trees. They even had bees where they made honey. All of, all of the houses were in a circle. And it's an acres of beautiful land on the commune on the outskirts of town. And of course, I started making my way and bossing people around. I started cooking and cleaning, telling people what to do. But that same gentleman that I found I met on the street. After about a year or so, he was mysteriously murdered. And in the papers, they had Isabel Van Wagner, the cook. How it was an accessory because she was the cook, she probably poisoned him. So I had to go to court to get my good name back. Oh, I got $16.41 for that case. I said, I indeed like this law. I have to tell my people to find refuge in this law. So I didn't like what was going on there. I said, good friend, what would you have me to do? He says, Belle, be about your father's business. I want you to walk up and down the countryside to preach about the ills of sin and slavery and to speak of the women's rights. He didn't have to tell me twice. I started getting ready. He said, Belle, where are you going? He says, I don't know. I said, well, Belle, how are you going to get there? He says, I don't know. I said, Belle, will you be back this side? He says, well, if I do, I'll come back and I'll say hi to everybody. I said, well, Belle, good luck to you. He said, all right, thank you very much. That morning, I left New York City with two dollars in my pocket and a smile in my heart. In my heart. I did not look back because, like Lot's wife, I might turn into a pillow of salt. All oh, that New York is the second son of God, I tell you. All oh, the things my eyes see, the things my ears hear, son of God, tomorrow I tell you that New York City. So I kept on walking. I said, now that I'm a free woman, I need a free woman's name. What shall I call myself? God told me to walk up and down the countryside to preach about the ends of sin and slavery and speak up for women's rights. Just like the people in the Bible. The people in the Bible sojourn on the mountains and the hillside and follow Jesus. The people in the Bible sojourn on the countryside and they follow Jesus. That's what I'm getting ready to do. I'm going to walk up and down the countryside. I'm going to sojourn the countryside. I am a sojourner. That's it. I'll call me sojourner. I like that. And I kept on walking and I kept on running. I said, now, most people got two names. What shall my last name be? Wherever I go, I'll speak what's on my heart. It's not fashionable for women to speak in public, but if the good Lord put it on my heart, I'm going to say it regardless. Wherever I go, I'm going to speak the truth. God is the truth and the light. Wherever I go, I'll speak the truth. That's it. Truth shall be my last name. So from this day forward, I shall be known as Sojourner Truth. I like that. I like that name. So, I started walking from city to city. I would go into each city and I would start to sing. People would gather around. And I would tell them of my days of being a slave and being sold and the beatings and the meanness of slavery. Sometimes the crowd got so rowdy they had rocks getting ready to throw at me. But I would start to sing they would let the rocks go. Sometimes they had to lock me up for my own safety. Because the crowd got too body. As soon as the crowd dispersed, they let me out. I was on to the next city speaking. The more that I spoke in different places, the crowd got bigger and bigger. More and more women started attending the gathering. And I would say, women, you got just as much right as the men folk who work outside the house and own your own property. No man should have dominion over the woman. So the word got around. So if you're the truth is speaking in public about women's rights. And she's right. But we were too afraid to speak.
she's speaking up. So more and more women started gathering. The crowd got larger and larger. It got so that I had to get a secretary to keep track of all my speaking engagement. Everybody wanted to sojourn the truth to come to their city. I didn't have to worry about a place to stay. They would say, so Jordan, you can stay at my house tonight. So Jordan, you can have my horse and buggy. So Jordan, you can use my canoe to get across the river. More and more people started gathering. Now, I have this little book. This little book I call the Book of Life. Everyone that I meet signed my little book of life. Now, these are some of the people who signed my little book of life. William Phillips, Harry Beecher Stowe, Charles Schultz, Lucretia Mott, Maria Child, George Thompson, Frederick Douglass, John Brown. How many tell them to put a mark right like there on the top of the page? Commander Ulysses Grant, President Abraham Lincoln, Jonathan Parker, Samuel May, Lydia Mott, Amy Post, William Skill, William Lord Garrison, Susan B. Anthony. They all signed my little book of life. Then I took some pictures of myself. When I did my speaking engagement, I would sell my pictures. Oh, and I put a few pennies in my pocket, I tell you. I called this. I sell the shadow to support the substance, you see. Then a good friend of mine, Miss Lydia Gage from New York City, said, well, you know what? Maybe you should write a book so that people in the future will know all about you. I said, well, I can't read nor write. She said, well, let's sit down and you tell me everything and I'll write it down. And I did just that. I sat down and I tell her everything about my life. She put it in a book called the Narratives of Sojourner Truth, The Northern Slave by Miss Lydia Gage. So when I did my speaking engagement, I had my picture to sell, then I had my book to sell. Oh, that put quite a few pennies in my pocket, I tell you. Because when I'm finished for my sojourn, I like to settle down in a little cabin somewhere. So, I did all my speaking engagement, walk up and down the countryside, I had more and more people gathered in large numbers. I walked and walked all across the northeast and the northwest. Sometimes I would ride in a horse and buggy, but most times I would walk, soldier when God showed me to do it. By now the civil war was upon us. My daughters were free from the Dumont. They moved into New York City. My husband Thomas and I just agreed to go on separate ways. So I continued my soul journey. They all stayed in New York City, but they were all free from the Dumont's. My oldest daughter, Diane, had a son by the name of Sammy. Sammy could read and write. So Sammy started traveling with me. He could read the newspaper and write my letters for me. I would say, Sammy, what's going on in the world? Well, Sammy, President Abraham Lincoln is undecided what to do with the former slaves down in Washington, D.C. at the Freedmen's Bureau. Say no more, Sammy. I'm going to go down to Washington, D.C. and advise President Lincoln what to do. Went on down to Washington, D.C. Place like this, full of people. Had flags and pictures on the wall and everything. We all waited to see President Lincoln. There is here's the first day. So the second day, they told us all to get in the line. We all got in the line. I waited my turn to see the president. Waited my turn. When it was my turn, I shook his hand. A nice, firm handshake. I like that. Now I'm kind of tall myself. But I have to look up at President Lincoln. Oh, he was a tall glass of water, I tell you. Real tall. And he invited me to come in the White House. Ain't that so? He invited me in to have tea. Oh, me and President Lincoln in the White House. I'm sitting in my tea. And I thank him for meeting with me. When he signed my little book of life, right here on the front page, for anti so 
turn to A. Lincoln, October 29, 1864. Now I'm going to jump to myself. I said, now, I'm his auntie. He wants to be my nephew. You better jump to myself. Now you see, back in those days, they called all the cutting women auntie. Because they didn't want to give them the proper respect of saying Miss or Miss, as you see. But I'm not here for privileges. I'm here to advise the president. I said, my president, I never heard of you until you run for office. He says, well, Andrew Sojourner, I've heard of you a long time before you came here to the White House. I said, now, ain't that something? You heard about me? He said, yes, I've heard about your good work that you're doing with the women's movement, the subject. And I applaud you for it. I thank you for that. He said, now, what do you think should be the first move I should do for the former slaves down here at the Freedom's Bureau. I said, Lord well, President Lincoln, here's what we need. We need lots of lumber. And we need to build a like open space. We need to build schools. But the little children need to learn to read and write, you see. We need to build homes, hospitals, churches. We need to build stores so we can bother with one another. Now, I don't expect you to do this overnight. But that would be a start. He says, Andrew Sojourner, I thank you kindly for those suggestions. And I'm going to act accordingly. So I finish up my tea. And I thank you for meeting with me. And I went on about my business. In about three months' time, the Lord had rolled in with freedom's people. President Lincoln kept his word. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. The loans started coming in. The people started building because they were all living in tents. And when it rained, it made the and it was a mess there. So I helped the best I could. I stayed down there for three years helping out. I would help the ladies make curtains for the windows, <coughs> so the clothes for the children, help them make shelves to put their dishes on. And I said, if anybody has to go to court, not to see the law, see me. I've got lost experience with the law. And twice I had to go to the court to speak on behalf of two people, and everything turned out okay. So, the one people was way on the outskirts of town. So I wanted to go inside the city of Washington, D.C. to see what was going on. I saw the most peculiar thing. There was a horse going a flatbed wagon with chairs on, and there was a railing around the hold on. I said, what is this contraption? I said, this is the streetcars of Washington, D.C. I said, well, what does a streetcar do? I said, well, you wave, the streetcar will stop, you put your bag on if you have bags, then you can just get on and ride to the next destination and tell them to stop. It will let you off. I said, oh. So the streetcar was coming around. I waited. The streetcar went on around. I knew it was going to come back around. So I waited until we got right around the corner. And I jumped in front of the horses. I grabbed the bridle. The horse was grabbing up. I said, Stop, I'm going to ride like everybody else. He says, Get out the way, I'm going to I'm going to I said, No, I want to ride like everyone else. And people started gathering around. And then he got to close and he says, All right. Get on. Sit right there. I says, no. I want to sit right next to you. You know when it gets so angry? Hit the horses with the whip. The horses took off when I was riding. When the streetcars of Washington, D.C. From then on, the streetcars of Washington, D.C. was like salt and pepper. Come to the west, right in together. Now, someday in the future, going to have someone to come along by the name of Rosa Parks. Now everyone thinks that Rosa Parks desegregated the bus system, but also Journal Truth did that back in Washington, D.C., you see, in the 1850s. A lot of folks don't realize that. So I finished riding on the streetcars of Washington, D.C. I finished my work at the Free Moose Bureau. I said, read the papers, Sammy. What's going on? It's time to move on. It says, well, Granny, the women in Akron, Ohio, is having a women's rights convention. Say no more, Sammy. I'm going to go on to Ohio and see what my sister is be after. Two days women's rights convention. I said, wait in the back. Oh, 
men put on the talking. Women don't need to be equal to a man. Women are not as smart as a man. I said, this is a women's rights convention. How come they want the men to do the talking? And remember, women dare not speak out in public in those days. They'll be ridiculed and never heard or seen again. But whatever the good Lord put on my heart, I'm going to say it regardless. So, first day I left. The next day, I put my chair a little bit closer to the front. Same thing going on. Women not as smart as men. These are the rules that managed to turn the world upside down. I said, I've got to get up there. How am I going to get up there? There were a few women sitting about two rows ahead of me. I said, they looked around and said, oh. So I'm telling the truth, who in the world? I was never invited anywhere. I just showed up all the time. I said, oh no, wherever she speak, she get the people so wound up. They'll pick the room this place down to the ground. I didn't hear them. I said, I just want to say a few words. No, don't back me up here. And one lady said, oh, maybe I can edit the program if we have some time. And I was going to wait till the end. They might run out of time. I said, don't let me get up there. Don't better speak. How am I going to get up there? So I started to sing. It was a Jesus. 
they pay time to move. So the women are asking, you better let them have it, because you can't stop it, it's coming. It's coming. So between us women in the North and my sisters in the South, you live so you can find yourself right in the middle, and that's a bad place to be. Bad place to be. Now also, you're not going be here to see, but they will come a day when women can vote, they can run for public office, they can own their own property, they can work outside the house. And it's coming. You can't stop it. Well, now, I thank you all kindly for letting me speak at this year convention. Also, Germany got nothing more to say. I thank you all kindly. Thank you all kindly. Thank you so much for your
student, someone who did something to change the face of history. And in 2017, so during two of us on the tale of this Norwegian grandmother. Yeah. So please come and take a closer look.